Many of you know me, and at least would recognize me <coughs> with or without the mask. I'm Bill Potter. I have the privilege uh, to be the founding director of CNS, a professor in our MPDS program. And while I chair many, many of these events, I can't say that I am always excited in advance of a seminar, but this is an occasion where I am indeed really excited uh, because of the speakers that we assembled here, and also because we don't have that many in-person events, and so I'm delighted to see uh, so many uh, students and faculty and staff and, and visitors uh, with us uh, today. Uh, this also is a, uh, an interesting uh, approach that we've taken, and I want to thank in particular uh, uh, Professor Cynthia Hecker for suggesting uh, uh, the title and the approach that we're going to follow uh, today, and that is a, a full-spectrum look at North Korea's nuclear program from above. Mr. Lewis, uh, on the ground, and I'm not sure whether that's Sig, okay, Sig, you're on the ground, and in person, uh, uh, Bob Carlin. We could not ask for three more qualified individuals to help us understand uh, the DPRK uh, and its nuclear program, both in the past and today, and perhaps also looking forward. And what really makes me excited about uh, the program is that I can count all of them now as part of the CNS team. Jeffrey's been with us a long time as the director of our East Asia Nonproliferation Program, really the, the, the inspiration and the leader of our work dealing with new tools, uh, open source tools for following uh, WMD developments in, in many countries, including the DPRK. Uh, professor uh, Sig Hecker is a distinguished uh, professor of practice, uh, which began about two months ago in Monterey, after a, a really distinguished career as a former director of Los Alamos National Laboratory, uh, a professor at Stanford University for some 17 years, is that correct? Um, and uh, uh, an individual who had the, the opportunity in North Korea to actually handle uh, the plutonium uh, to uh, ascertain that it was, in fact, a plutonium. And I'm sure Sig will tell you more about his experiences. And Bob Carlin, who has joined us as a uh, non resident scholar, uh, has an exceptionally distinguished and long career uh, in the field. Going back, in fact, my notes serve me well to 1974 uh, when he uh, joined the U.S. intelligence community, uh, worked at the CIA, the State Department, uh, was in charge of uh, the State Department's uh, Northeast uh, Division in the Bureau of Intelligence and Research, um, was a senior advisor for many years uh, to uh, U.S. negotiators who were involved in deliberations with the DPRK and probably spent as much time on the ground uh, in North Korea as, as any single individual. So they're all part of the CMS team. You will probably discern over the course of their deliberations that they come at the issue from different perspectives. They may not agree on everything, but that's the whole point of, of having them join us today. And so rather than say more about their credentials and the topic, I'm going to turn it over, over to, uh, to Jeffrey. I've asked each of them to speak for about 10 to 15 minutes so that we have a, a good uh, uh, 50 minutes for uh, discussion among our very distinguished uh, uh, audiences. So, uh, Jeffrey, it's a pleasure to welcome you. Oh, great. Uh, so I'm going to give a fast version of a longer presentation. So we'll skip some of the slides. It's like, don't freak out if there seems like a lot, but we're going quickly. In general, what I wanted to talk about is how our open source team looks at North Korea. And that's loosely organized around the idea of people, places, and things, which is to say we identify people, we locate places, and we model things. And our argument is that this is a particular way of knowing about the world. So we, we all kind of lived through this a little bit with uh, the invasion of Ukraine, which is we saw that there are different ways of knowing about the world. Right? One way of knowing about the world is to try to understand how the Russian government makes decisions. Uh, another way of knowing is to literally watch where the army goes. Right? And these are both valid and important ways of knowing, and you need them both. Uh, 
But obviously when we're sitting here in Monterey and are not as lucky as Sig to be able to get to go to North Korea, um, we're stuck IDing people, places, and things. So just to give you a quick example, um, this is a way in which identifying people can be valuable. Surely you've seen Kim Jong-un in pictures like this, right? Who the heck are these people? We always go through and identify every single individual in these pictures because who attends a particular event and where they stand tells you an enormous amount about what's actually happening. And as a practical example of this, um, this summer we got a, an announcement from the North Koreans that they had had a meeting of their, their party's central military commission, which is like basically their big body that's responsible uh, for nuclear weapons decisions. And all they said was that they were modifying the operation duties of frontline units of the KPA. And they gave us a couple of pictures, right? So like, what does that mean? Right? To us, it meant something really momentous, which we think now is pretty much happened, which is that North Korea is deploying tactical nuclear weapons to frontline artillery units. That's a really big deal. But the question is, how do you get that judgment out of that vague sense? And one of the answers is people. Right. So they, they met over two days, uh, and you can tell that because Kim Jong-un changes clothes, which is great. Uh, and on day two, they, there's this whole long video, and there's one second, and I'll show you this little clip. Right? He's talking, and they show you this guy, and then they cut away. Okay? That's all you get. Okay? That's Kim Jong-un sick. He is the number two party official uh, responsible for the munitions industry, and he is the head of the missile program. Right? So you can infer that what's happening when they're talking about new capabilities for frontline units, that it is a missile capability and probably a nuclear missile capability because in one little second, right, you see the relevant party official present. Right? If he's not there, it's something else. But if he's there, it basically can't be anything else because, like, that's what he does. Um, there's another example of this which helps uh, emphasize this, which is in April, uh, North Korea did a, uh, an event for frontline commanders, right? and they showed a new missile uh, being tested, and it was a very unusual picture because normally when missiles are tested, Kim poses with the people who made the missile. This is the first time he posed with the people who were getting the missile. And it's a little hard to tell, but we get weird because we know what people look like from the back. Like, we literally have a catalog of people's bald spots. Uh, <laughs> that's Kim Jong sick, right? It's all frontline commanders and two uh, missile test officials. And they actually tell you in the announcement in April that Kim Jong sick was present, right? So you're able to sort of map these things over time by telling who shows up. So that allowed us to reach the judgment, which, by the way, ha-ha, we all discovered uh, about a month ago, right, when the North Koreans came out and announced that, yes, right, all of the missile exercises that they had been doing over the past two months were part of the deployment of tactical nuclear weapons to frontline units, right? So for us, the thing that unlocked that idea was the presence of Kim Jong-sik at the meeting where the decision was made. They didn't tell us what decision they made, but you could infer it by the people who were present. We do the same thing with places. Uh, and this is probably gonna, you know, be, uh, I don't know, for the students working on it, you're gonna be like, oh God, do I get a break? There's this place called the February 11th plant near Ham Hung. Yeah, that's right, they're already laughing. All right. We were really interested in this place because it had this funny character. Every time Kim Jong-un went, like a day or two later, he went and saw a missile test. It was just like a weird, funny coincidence, as though he went and like saw the people who were responsible for building the missile, and then like a few days later, checked out their handle. Now that doesn't prove anything, okay? This is about how you think about places. You just note it. That's weird, right? <laughs> So you have to figure out where it is. Now they're not going to tell you where the February 11th plan is. Happily, he took a choo-choo train there. Uh, this makes life much easier, right? Because you know that it's going to be a factory. It's going to have a uh, you know nice uh, rail line leading into it. Uh, and we did this a few years ago. Uh, turns out it's not too hard. We find the place. Okay, it's a it's it's a factory in a place called Hamham. And it's a really 
really interesting facility. Uh, I know in this image you can't really see it, but there is a train line, and there are some underground facilities right here. And indeed, Kim walks through them. This is one of my favorite all-time guidance tours. Uh, we don't know the names of the plant managers, but we've identified them. When you don't know the names, what would you do? We give them nicknames. So this is uh, Larry, Curly, and Mo. Um, you're going to want to watch Larry here. This is going to make you laugh. Larry's tired. <laughs> do you like how as soon as he yawns, he steps back and the cameraman jerks it away? We're terrified Larry's going to get like executed by firing sure. squad. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Yeah, this, that's Larry yawning. <laughs> it's real boring. All right. Once we locate it, plot thickens, right? Because this facility is near a bunch of other facilities that we've positively identified as being part of North Korea's solid propellant rocket program. Uh, it's near the place where they test their solid propellant rocket motors. It's near the place they make the propellant. And it's near the place where they make all the fancy, specialized parts that don't involve metal. So it's like right there. Again, doesn't prove anything, but like, I get that's kind of weird, right? I mean, it's like all, all part of the same thing. So it's on our list. We have a suspicion about it. And then in January, Kim Jong-un visited a munitions factory producing a major weapon system. The North Koreans don't tell us anything. They don't tell us where it is. They don't tell us its name. They release the pictures. They blur out the plant manager's faces. I do not believe this is an effective censorship strategy. Even with their faces blurred, can you not tell that that's Larry, Curly, and Mo? <laughs> Larry, my dude, I am so happy you did not get executed for yawning in front of Kim Jong-un. <laughs> He's fine! Right. We had a suspicion that this was a munitions factory involved in their missile program, and now we know it is a factory that is an important munitions factory, uh, and that, that sort of, that deepens, right? What's really neat is uh, we go through each of these facilities and we identify every single piece of equipment. Uh, neither of them are here, but John Ford and Stephen De La Fuente actually have particular machine tools named after them. Uh, in this particular factory, the green tools, which we saw on the visit that Kim took the train to do, are the same machine tools that have been repainted in the visit that he took with the plant managers in 2022 with their faces blue. It's the same equipment. It is literally the same plant. And when you look at it really closely, start looking at the pictures, what you realize is they're making missile airframes. Right? And they actually give you a picture of, of one of the airframes, as well as the piece of equipment that's used to make it. Right? So our intuition was right. Right? But this is actually a really sensitive location involved in the manufacture of missiles. We weren't really able to prove it until much later, but boy, it's good to put a pin in a place. Right? Okay, the last thing is things. Well, let's talk about this little missile, because this is the missile that's getting deployed, one of the missiles getting deployed to these frontline units, right? So, like, how does this work? Can they really do this? Well, this missile is really odd. Uh, and here I give my colleague Farron Stelnoki Veris a little credit. Uh, he modeled the trajectory of this missile. It does something called a pull-up maneuver. So it doesn't, like a ballistic missile goes up and comes down. But when this missile comes back into the atmosphere, it has little fins on it, and it does a little pull-up, and it glides a little bit, and then it goes back down. That puts a huge amount of aerodynamic stress on the airframe, and it gets really hot. Uh, the, do you see the big glowing missile as it comes back in? Right? Like, you need a really strong metal airframe to be able to do something like that. And the question is, like, how can you make it? Well, when we first saw this missile, like, we model these things, things, really closely. So when we first saw this missile, people said it looked like Russia's Iskander missile. I mean, kind of, sort of, yeah, but, like, I don't know, not really. Right? Like, you could tell little things like the cable raceway, which is the place where the cables that connect the guidance at the front of the missile to the engine at the base, or at least the, the nozzle and the steering, um, is longer, right? It actually physically looks different. And we measure these things. So if you come work for the open source team, like you're gonna have to like measure missiles, which is 
can't, I be honest, is a little bit painful. It's not the same size as Russia's SDK. Right? So we actually think, and we built a full 3D model of the thing, both a computer model that you can look at, but also uh, parameters, and poor Michael Dutzman has to fly these things out. <laughs> um, it's not the same size, and it doesn't perform the same as in a standard, right? It's, it's a similar type of missile, but it is not the same missile. Now, one reason we do this is we want to know how far it can fly, right? And so, great, I give you like a nice range estimate. But there are these kinds of little interesting things, which is we saw that big green machine behind the metal airframe, right? And I'll, I'll, I'll spare you the video. If you don't know what a flow forming machine is, it's a flow forming machine, which is a way of making extremely high strength um, metal tubes. And you can make things that are tubes too. Um, and so, like, that's a well-documented industrial process. I uh, hear a bunch of Indian scientists who work in their missile program talking about doing it. But that's literally the explanation for how you can build an airframe that is relatively thin and light, but nonetheless can stand up to the rigors of doing the pull-up maneuver and deal with the, it's not the sole reason, but it is part of the story of how North Korea can do this. Because one of the questions is like, well, if they didn't just like import it from Russia, like how did they pull it off? And and the answer is because they imported the machines probably from China or secondhand someplace because they're pretty old machines. But they imported the machines that would allow them to make stuff like this. <clears throat> the last thing I want to say is there is this kind of like funny serendipity um, to what we do, and you kind of never know what work is going to lead to other work. When we were trying to figure out, like, is the North Korean thing a copy of the Russian Iskander, or is it even a Russian system that's been imported, we spent a lot of time looking at the base, because the base of those two rockets looks really different. So these things here are steering. They're jet vanes. They're basically just vanes that stick into the exhaust, and they swivel, which kind of causes the exhaust to go in different ways, so you can steer the missile. And you can tell that they're physically different. Right? They don't look the same. This isn't something they imported from Russia. It's something they built themselves that has the same function, but is physically different. But for the longest time, we wondered, like, what are all these like circular things on the base of the Russian Iskander that don't appear on the North Korean missile? Does anybody know what they are? Oh, Sammy, you know, you're on the team. You don't get to... They're penetration aids for, um, for uh, missile defenses. So the Russians have been using real Iskanders in Ukraine, and they pop off these, uh, these little canisters that are designed to fool missile defenses. They have a flare on them, and they have some electronics in them, uh, and they sit in those little circles. And so... A funny consequence of the research we did is we end up being quoted in this story because we were shown these penetration aids and they're like, where would those go in the missile? We're like, I know exactly where those would go, right? Those go in the little circles on the base. But then it also tells you a second thing, which is that North Korea's copy of the Iskander doesn't have penetration aids for missile defenses, or at least not yet. So. That to me is, is kind of a, that's just a sort of delightful little random thing. Uh, so coming up on my, my 15 minute mark, that's all I really wanted to say. Uh, other than just to sort of generally note, right, that this is a, this is a particular and distinct way of knowing about the world, uh, which we can do here. And, and honestly, as the team is discovering, like you all can do, uh, it's incredibly accessible. Thank you so much, Jeffrey. That was fascinating. Uh, and we'll return with Q&A uh, after we hear from our other two uh, speakers here. So, <clears throat> see, you are up. And so you're on the ground here. Yeah. Uh, Jeffrey, could you set that timer for me? <laughs> so I can stay, try to stay as close. You the, don't have to be on time. You're yeah. famous. <laughs> I have to be on time because I'm nobody. <laughs> but he knows how to entertain. 
<laughs> and I don't. You got it. <laughs> but the, uh, the, the reason I'm here, quite frankly, as I look out, is, is all these young faces. You, you know, you might wonder, uh, what else do you do after 34 years at Los Alamos, 17 at Stanford, uh, you, you try to stay close uh, to the young people. That's what I do here in Monterey and at Texas A&M University. So, uh, as was pointed out, uh, I'm going to do this sort of on the ground, and then particularly uh, the issue of, uh, of on the ground in the uh, nuclear world. Oh, and say one thing, I just, you know, I did my introduction without any notes, but we have to acknowledge that Dr. Hecker has a very important book that will be out very soon. And so if you want to say a bit about that in the course of your... So, uh, yeah. Okay, uh, so I, mean, I well, forgot I, to let mention me just, It's called Hinge Points. Uh, and actually, uh, Sarah Bidford uh, interviewed me today for the Machiavelli show, which she has. Uh, and we talked about the, uh, the book Hinge Points, an inside look at North Korea nuclear program. And that's exactly what I'm going to talk about, is that inside look. Because Jeffrey can tell you everything from the outside, and all I can say, I'm glad he's not watching my house in Santa Fe. <laughs> so I mean, but we don't know what's going on in the inside. Well, it turns out the North Koreans had wanted us to know some of the things on the inside, uh, and they've invited me, and I had the great pleasure. Actually, I went with Bob Carlin and his uh, Stanford and my Stanford colleague, uh, uh, John Lewis. So, so that's what I'm going to talk about. And what I thought I would do, though, to put some meat on this, not just tell you all you know, the war stories as to how I went to North Korea, how I held the plutonium in my hands, I can tell all of that. But so what good is it all? So what does it do for you to get that inside knowledge? Because this is different than intelligence collection. You know, for the most part, the intel folks have had no opportunities like I've had uh, to go in. So you've got to do something with that knowledge. And that's what I, I tried to do. And so what I thought I would do uh, is to, I'm going to tell you, uh, you know, I've been in North Korea, uh, how I interacted with, with them, and then how do I use that knowledge, and of course my knowledge of the 34 years at, at Los Alamos, to try to answer this question uh, related to nuclear testing. Uh, because they've been ready to do the seventh nuclear test at least for six months now, uh, maybe more. They haven't done it yet. And so the question is, what kind of test would they do next? Of course, you can try to pull all of that out of the air, but I'm going to try to show you that because of the access I've had and sort of my time at Los Alamos, you can take a really good educated estimate of that. So that's, that's what I'm going to do. But, but in all of my nuclear stuff, all of my lectures, I always go back to the fundamentals. The fundamentals being there are three requisites for a nuclear arsenal. You got to get the bomb fuel, and so that means either high enriched uranium or plutonium. Uh, you, or in the case of hydrogen bombs, uh, the deuterium and, and tritium. Uh, you got the weaponization, and, and that's design and build and test. And then you have to deliver. And Jeffrey just told us a lot uh, about their uh, delivery systems. So that's, that's what I target uh, with my visits. I try to understand these things. And, and, and where Jeffrey uh, and, and his view is particularly good on that front end, he, you know, he can tell us whether the reactors are operating or not uh, in Young Gun. It's a little more difficult with the, uh, uh, with the centrifuges, of course. And then on the missiles end, he can tell us a lot by what he does. And weaponization, as I will tell you, is actually rather little. And, and the way that we track that is through the nuclear tests. We actually see what they've done. And so this is what they've done so far. Uh, and we're reasonably well agreed, the community. So more or less, you know, we measure the yield through the seismic signals, you know, the way they make the Earth shake. And we pick that up. And the CTBTO, the uh, Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty Organization, has these monitors all over the world, uh, and they pick them up, and then we convert that. But there's some estimates involved in that because you have to understand the geology. And so these are more or less the numbers uh, that we get. Uh, we can argue about them a little, but that's, uh, that's the size. But what are they? And what's next? That's where the rest of the story comes in. And that's where the on-the-ground visits come in. So here are my first six visits to North Korea. Uh, starting in January of 2004, 
were standing above the spent fuel pool. Uh, and that's when I first held the uh, plutonium. So from that visit, I had a sense as to what do they know about plutonium. By the way, I came back and I, I went as non-governmental, even though I was still at Los Alamos at, at that time. Uh, I went as non-governmental, I came back, told the government folks, look, what I just saw, that plutonium I saw, these guys know how to build the bomb. Uh, then I went back every one of those years, and, and each time we learned something else, not only from the facilities that they showed us, but the people that we talked to, and that's really the key part. And these folks, quite frankly, they weren't BSing me. I mean, they knew something <laughs> that I know something about plutonium, and I know something about bombs. And so we had good exchange, very good discussion. This is the director of the Young Gen facility at the time, Liam uh, Sop. Uh, and at that particular time, we were there two weeks after the first nuclear test. Uh, they were very guarded as to how much they did. They said it worked, and we're filled with pride. And I said, well, it didn't seem to work so well. <laughs> Actually, the military guy said, well, you know, Dr. Hecker, of all people, it's a lot harder to make a small bomb than a big bomb. <laughs> I said, right. Okay, here I am. This, this is me in front of the glove box. Uh, again, you can just imagine for me to go through the glove box lines. You know, I first had my hands in a glove box at Los Alamos as a summer student in 1965, so, so a long time ago. Uh, and so I've done uh, much of that work. So that's again uh, 2008, 2009, and then 2010 was the really big surprise. They not only, you know, on one hand showed me the plutonium, here they showed me the centrifuges, which they had denied uh, essentially uh, all, almost all of the way up to, up to this time. Uh, Bob was with me uh, also uh, together uh, with uh, John. So now they have highly enriched uh, uranium. From looking at the glove boxes, from looking at the operations, looking at the size of things, I was able to get a pretty good sense, uh, and not only what do they know about plutonium, but you know, how much can they make, what's their throughput, and so forth. So, so we learned that. And, and then as Jeffrey uh, has already done, uh, you also have to interpret their photographs that they intentionally you know, put out on the web. And this is the flow forming machine uh, for making not, not only the missile parts, about rotors for the centrifuges, uh, and that's exactly uh, what happened here. So you put all of that together, and so that's what I've done now for these last 18 years. You know, after each visit, I try to make an estimate as to what do they have. Well, for plutonium, you know, you start with uranium ore, the mining, milling, fuel fabrication. They have this five megawatt gas graphite reactor. In 2004, they took us into the control room. That's you know when you make the plutonium, but it's in the spent fuel. Then you have to extract the plutonium. So I walk down this corridor with them in the reprocessing facility, ask them every question I can think of about the Purex process, and these guys know this stuff. And so again, this is the sort of inside information that really gives you a sense that you're dealing with people that know how to build the bomb, and they do. So that's, that's what we put together, and as I say in red, for plutonium, it's reasonably straightforward. That reactor, at best, can make six kilograms per year. It's more or less sort of one bomb's worth. Uh, when it's operating at full power, you know, for, for most of the year. Uh, and we know when it's operating, you know, nowadays, you know, thanks to Jeffrey, before that, you know, the government would give you a hint. So they've made very little plutonium. Actually, when you put it all together, because they haven't run that operator that much, so it's less than 50 kilograms uh, of plutonium, and we have pretty high confidence uh, that that range, you know, is probably where they are. Okay, then we go to to um, the enrichment, to the centrifuge, and, and that's much much tougher. Again, you start with uranium ore, but this time you convert it uh, to this this really neat compound, uranium hexafluoride which you can turn into a gas, you spin it in the centrifuge, you separate the 235, the bond rate stuff, from the natural 238, you do all of that. And then we go through estimates. We did some pretty fancy detailed estimates of this, and, and, and our best estimate is they can probably make, and still today, about 150 kilograms, which for highly enriched uranium, which isn't as potent as plutonium for a bomb, uh, maybe is about six bombs worth. 
Uh, and since they've been doing this for some time, and, you know, and we have a pretty good idea as to when they were running uh, the, the centrifuges from our discussions uh, with them after the fact. So we have the estimate of maybe 800 to 1,000 kilograms by now. But by the way, if you think that's a lot, uh, the, the Soviets, uh, as they collapsed to the Soviet Union, had 1,250,000 kilograms of high-resist uranium. So this is a drop uh, in the bucket. What's the level of and our confidence is, is very low. What's the level of enrichment? Oh, so let's say, so generally, this is for up to 90%. So we're talking about weapons grade. Certainly above 80 and mostly right around 90. But we don't know, we, we don't have a single measurement of any of that. It's only through my discussions with them that we actually, I make the estimate as to what kind of centrifuges are these, because you can't tell from the way we look at it here. It's through discussions with them when they, I said, these are margin steel which is the one for the higher grade uh, uh, centrifuge and then separation. Uh, and they finally, I got him to say that it, it's an alloy of iron. Well, it turns out more aging is an alloy of iron. Okay, and then again, the, these are the things, I think uh, Jeffrey actually dubbed this one the disco ball, uh, <laughs> of, of where they specifically wanted to show us that, look, we've got one small enough, they happen to have a missile close by that they can fit this into. So that was in, uh, back in 2016. Now you say, look, they probably can fit one in uh, into these sh uh, short arrangements. And then this one, before the really big bomb test that I showed you, uh, they showed this thing. Uh, and, and here's Kim Jong-un talking to none other than Director Lee hun -sung, who by this time now was, was actually taken from Young Byung to run the Nuclear Weapons Institute which they also had actually uh, mentioned on, on KCMA. Uh, so we put all of these things together now. And so now I go back and say, OK, on the basis of this knowledge, what do I think they actually tested? Like, when did they get the plutonium? How much do they have? How much tritium might they have? You have to make tritium in a reactor also, so you have to op operate the reactor. And then how much and when did they first get the highly enriched uranium, uh, which in my opinion wasn't until 2010 and after. So then we put this together. The first one that didn't work so well was likely plutonium. The second one was likely plutonium. We don't think they had highly enriched uranium. Besides, the director of their facility told me, Dr. Hecker, that plutonium we used for the test came from here, you know, as I walked uh, through their glove boxes and their facilities. So those were plutonium. First one didn't work well. Second one, they got it right. So two to seven is just as good as seven to 14. Uh, and uh, so that was plutonium. But the third one, oops, I had superimposed some things on there. Sorry about that. Uh, in essence, what it says, that third one, I believe, uh, then is their first HEU test. So by this time now, they've had a few years of highly enriched uranium production. Uh, and they do the highly enriched uranium. So they now have plutonium, they have some experience, they have highly enriched uranium. Then the fourth one, they actually announced, they said it was a hydrogen bomb. Uh, and what we also know is that one was buried deeper than others, but the yield is not consistent with a hydrogen bomb. So 7 to 14 kilotons. However, and this is the other part where we put all these things together, I, I not only did this sort of analysis, I've talked to the Russians, I've talked to the Chinese, and the Chinese were particularly helpful uh, of saying, look, don't mirror image their program after yours. You know, maybe you should mirror image theirs after ours. Uh, and so together, we actually came up with this idea that this was not a hydrogen bomb, but it was a proof of principle of a hydrogen bomb. So most likely, it was a plutonium primary. It was the most, not, the most likely what we call boosted, the deuterium and tritium but they didn't have anything in the secondary, and that is the hydrogen part. Then in September 2016, they came back, uh, and they were, were looking to do the short and medium range missile with highly enriched uranium. And then in 2017, with this proof of principle test, they went off and set off the big one, and said that was a hydrogen bomb test. So that's the sort of picture I put together on the basis of everything I know about what they did. You also have to understand what missiles you know, do they want to use, because the missile and 
the warhead interface uh, is crucial. Uh, and, and here, um, for example, this, this was in the Defense Expo of 2021. Uh, and if you look at all those different missiles, and if you look at what, what Jeffrey showed you, this KM-23 or the KM-24, again, the warhead has to be matched uh, with the missile. And what we call the stockpile to target sequence. In other words, what that warhead is going to see on the way from the time you shoot it off until it, it gets to the target. It sees temperatures, G loads, pressures, and all of that. All of that can affect the warhead. So the testing has to be such that you can really understand what's there. Okay, so that's, that's where we are. Uh, and now for the uh, question that I posed at the beginning. So on the basis of that, would they want to test again? And the answer is, if you're dog on the right, they want to test again. They want to put them in all those other missiles that Jeffrey showed. You need to test again. Would they go for strategic needs or theater needs? That depends where Kim Jong-un wants to go. And so for strategic needs, for the missiles and the warhead to reach the United States, if that's what he thinks is really important, they have to test. They have to do a full-range missile test, and they have to do uh, a more uh, nuclear test. However, they may just be satisfied of having the deterrent because they can reach all uh, of South Korea. And Japan. That's where it would go. And we've we've had arguments uh, with uh, with lots of people about you call them tactical nuclear weapons. What do you actually call them? The best thing going back to the 1950s is what we call them in relation to theater nuclear weapons, then they can be battlefields, they can be short-range missiles in the theater. So which one would he go? The answer is, we don't know. And that, to some extent, depends on what Kim Jong-un says. My own view, what I would do if I were in their shoes, I would do two for the price of one. And, and Jeffrey can tell you the different. They have two tunnels that they've been preparing. And so they could, and we've done it, we've done three for the price of one. You mean at the same time? It's a very serious Simultaneous. So that's the answer. Uh, 17 minutes. Bob, it's yours. You're allowed. <laughs> Thanks so much. It, and it was entertaining as well, very informative. <laughs> Bob, you have the floor. Uh, well, you, you now have two uh, fabulous presentations on um, what most people focus on, uh, which is uh, the tec technical military capabilities and maybe intentions of the North Koreans, which is obviously crucial, but it's not the only thing that Kim Jong-un has on his plate. He's also thinking about diplomacy, he's also thinking about domestic economic issues. Uh, he has a whole range of things he's thinking about. And those are not as easily accessible uh, from overhead, although there can be overhead work that can advance your knowledge on that. Um, more likely, uh, it's, it's in the personal interaction that, that Sig mentioned. Let me, let me start actually by taking uh, one minute, because I see a lot of young people in here, uh, about sort of life's wandering path. I was in, I was in Monterey in 1968, Institute of Foreign Studies, uh, learning intensive Chinese. Why? Because this was not Xi Jinping's China, this was not Deng Xiaoping's China, this was Mao Zedong's China. This was the Cultural Revolution. This was a very scary China to Americans because we knew nothing about it. So I figured I want to learn Chinese. And I studied Chinese at Harvard after that. And then I decided to go into the CIA. And because I knew Chinese, the CIA put me on Japan, <laughs> <laughs> which I knew nothing about. So I learned um, for uh, two, two and a half years working on Japan. Then I got a phone call from a friend of mine in another section of the CIA. He said, Bob, there's a great job opening. And I said, oh, really? What is it? He said, it's analyzing uh, North Korean media. 
And I said, I don't know anything about North Korea. And he said, don't worry, nobody else does either. <laughs> so I said, that sounds interesting. And so for the next 49 years, I was working on North Korea. <laughs> And now here I am again, back in Monterey. Uh, sort of full circle is interesting. Okay, I want to talk about sort of the five circles of knowledge uh, about North Korea on other than technical issues. Although some of it also, good, as Jeffrey pointed out, some of it is from the media. The first circle, the outermost circle, think of it as, the, as Pluto. Very dark, very cold. It's the place where common wisdom about North Korea resides. Um, idle, ill-informed speculation. You really don't want to make that your home, if you're going to wait. Uh, you really want to get to one of the other circles. The next circle in is um, the study of North Korean media. It's amazing how critical uh, the critical role that North Korea media plays in our understanding about North Korea. You wouldn't think so, but if you rigorously and systematically read the media, and you pick up the signals that they want us to pick up, because they want us to know certain things about them. Some of it is misleading, and you have to learn to read that out. Uh, but uh, for years and years, they, when they were part of the sort of the communist world, that's how communist countries um, communicated with each other through the media, in large part. <clears throat> Very important to read it systematically. Why? Because not everything that's in the media is equally important. Some of it truly is just propaganda. You can push it to the side. Some of it is authoritative. Uh, exposition of policy and perceptions. And that's what you want to latch on to. That's what, over time, you want to be able to make the comparisons and draw the conclusions. It's not easy to do. This is where we were when I first started on North Korea in 1974. And for about 15, 18 years, this is all we had. We could not visit North Korea. North Koreans could not come to the United States. It was like being one of the Aztec priests looking at the heavens. We knew there was going to be an eclipse of the moon from all the signs. If you asked us why, like you would ask an Aztec, Aztec priest, he would say, well, the great rabbit in the sky is going to eat the moon. I mean, we didn't really have a, a, a good understanding of why these things were going to happen. But the North Koreans were signaling us and we got pretty good at reading those things. I got good enough of it. At one point, we were having dinner in North Korea. Uh, and uh, the first one of the vice ministers, foreign ministry vice ministers was there. And I said to them, could you ask the people at the party daily, Nodong um, Shinmun, uh, if they could print it so the lines are farther apart? And he said, well, why? And I said, well, I have to read between the lines. Okay, the next circle in is, is actual context with North Koreans. And we did not get to that point until about 1989, when it became possible for uh, North Koreans to visit the U.S. We still couldn't go to North Korea, or only a very few people could go. You gotta understand, until 1988-89, no one from the State Department was allowed to be in the same room as a North Korean. You can imagine how that cut our ability to interact and actually understand what these guys were talking about. That changed in 88-89, and as we could meet with them, we began hearing from their own voice in their own vocabulary, some of their positions, which actually they were putting out in the newspaper, but because the vocabulary they use in their propaganda is very strange to American ears. Uh, we didn't always get it, but then when you could hear them explain it, 
you could put the two together and you understood well that what they were what they were getting at. We also learned that there's a difference, uh, that not everything is equally important. When we had a meeting very early on, maybe 1990 at Stanford, and uh, John Lewis had invited South Koreans and North Koreans and a couple of us from the State Department as observers. Uh, at one point, um, actually the North Koreans were very well behaved in this meeting. Uh, adhered to the guidelines, you know, of, of, the, uh, of how the meeting was to take place. The South Koreans were a little bit stiff-necked and unctuous. It was sort of surprising. Anyway, at one point I had received uh, a North Korean statement. One of the front organizations made some very tough statements about the South Koreans. So I went up to one of the North Koreans who was a foreign, foreign ministry diplomat, and I said to him, you're talking about improving relations with South Korea. Why in the world would you put out a statement that is so abrasive and negative? He said, well, what do you mean? And so I showed it to him. He reads it and he shakes his head. He said, Mr. Carlin, this is not policy. This is propaganda. Well, for a North Korean to make that distinction opened a lot of doors for me in understanding that they make that distinction, and we have to make it as well. Uh, the fourth circle is um, actually the official meetings and negotiations. That's critical because unlike the contacts where uh, uh, the people can speak a little bit more, maybe a little bit more freely, in the negotiations you're getting the policy positions, right, articulated. But when you begin to see, as you trace the evolution of these policies, you can trace them back to the, the decisions that they're making. That's critical to understand. You don't want to get blocked by just the vocabulary. What you're trying to see is, in Pyongyang, when they're making new decisions, under what circumstances, and therefore, how they're reacting to the American positions at the table and the environment we're creating around the talks. Also something about the, um, the way they conduct themselves diplomatically, which is not <coughs> crazy. It's uh, having been in the State Department, you begin to see how different countries conduct their diplomacy. North Korean diplomats are among the very best that I ever saw. Uh, they're smart, they're perceptive, uh, they don't accept uh, American baloney, which, of which we have a lot, <laughs> sorry to say. Um, and, and they have a style which is very important to understand. At one point in the talks, um, uh, Bill Clinton had just gone, this was not, probably 1993, Bill Clinton had just gone to the DMZ and had made some threat about if the North Koreans did anything, more or less, they would become a parking lot. Okay. Here we're engaged in talks with the North Koreans and the President of the United States is suggesting that we could destroy them. So, the next meeting we had, I was braced for something, uh, pushback from the North Koreans. Sure enough, the North Korean chief negotiator started out with a blistering <coughs> attack on the Americans, which made it look like the talks were going to be worthless, right? He finishes the statement, he takes off his glasses, he puts the statement aside, and he says, okay, now, let's talk. <laughs> <laughs> that tells you something about the guidelines that he has to operate under. In fact, it's a pattern break, in, a, in effect. He has to say certain things to push back, but they really want to make progress. And so how are we going to make that progress with them? And then the final, the final circle is sort of the one that Sid uh, described, which is boots on the ground, actually visiting North Korea. I was there over 30 times. One of the last times I was there, 
uh, driving from the airport, the Ford Ministry escort in the front seat, turned to me and said, Mr. Crowley, you've been here 33 times. Why do you keep coming to our country? <laughs> and I said to him, I don't know. <laughs> maybe, maybe you can tell me. The, f the fact is, um, you know, I have, I have tremendous respect for photo interpreters. Uh, it's irreplaceable. But the fact is, it does not replace being on the ground. Uh, seeing the place in 3D, on the ground, seeing the people as they interact, seeing the fields, seeing the roads. Uh, and so, uh, without that fifth circle, it seems to me, there's always the gap in understanding the extent to which this is a three-dimensional country on planet Earth. I like to tell people, people, people say, well, how are we supposed to understand the North Koreans? And I say to them, fundamentally, what you don't know about South Korea, what you don't understand about South Korea, you won't understand about North Korea. It is Korean. These are still Koreans. They still operate according with, within sort of the, the Korean cultural uh, framework, civilization, you know, historical civilization. But it's hard to grasp that unless you're in the country, hear them talking, and see them interacting. Uh, when you know that, you, you, you overlay that on what you read in the media, and you begin to get a full picture of how they operate, how they think, how they react, why they react that way to the United States, and, and possibly where they might be. Uh, it's always going to be desperate. And right now we're back in the same position we used to be. We can't visit. We can't meet with them. They've cut back in what they put into their media. Uh, and so we're, we're running on fumes to some extent. Uh, I hope that doesn't continue, but uh, the, the more, the longer it goes that we don't meet with them, uh, the longer or the more, the deeper we're going to sink into our own morass of misunderstanding. Well, I thank you so much. I think as, as you uh, probably know, uh, one of the hallmarks of uh, uh, Monterey and our educational approach is to really understand the language, the culture, the history, which requires our students to spend time in country. So I think if you were to pass around a, a notepad today for people who want to sign up for the next tour that you're leading, <laughs> for the 34th visit, uh, a large number of folks in this room who want to join you, myself included. <laughs> so we, we've had, I think, a, a really fascinating uh, set of, of presentations uh, today. And we've also uh, managed somehow to reserve about 45 minutes or so uh, for uh, Q&A. And so I would ask if you, if you have a question, you might raise your hand because so many people are masked, even some of my closest friends I may not recognize, but I'm always pointing your direction and I can tell Sarah's about to ask the question. So, Sarah, if you want to introduce yourself as well and then ask the question. I will, and I hope it's okay if I'm just going to take yeah. off my mask so that you can see me. I'm Sarah Bidgood. I direct our Eurasian Non-Proliferation Program here at CNS. Thank you so much, Jeffrey, Sig, and Bob. This was so fascinating. Um, I'm not, a, by any stretch of the imagination, a North Korea expert, so I'm always so curious to learn. Um, Bob, I was really struck in your remarks. It sounds like, you know, to some extent, your ability to interact with North Koreans was really dictated by changes in U.S. policy. Mm -hmm. You talked about 1988, 1989, when it sounds like State Department officials were able to be in the same room. Can you shed some light on what kind of precipitated those changes in thinking on the U.S. side about either the importance of interacting with North Koreans or, or sort of what was responsible for those shifts that allowed you to, to gain that important intel? Well, that's very receptive question. Uh, as I recall, there were actually two things. <clears throat> One was we were getting our first inklings that they had a nuclear program, mm -hmm. and it worried people. Mm -hmm. Secondly, the South Koreans, by 1988-89, were ahead of us in um, their own dealings with the North Koreans, and therefore we were not, we wouldn't be pulling them, dragging them from from behind, mm. if we moved, but that they were they were uh, uh, plowing the path ahead. Just one example: 
at one point early in the uh, administration of uh, Noteu, which he came in late 87, early 88, they sent one of their foreign ministry officials to the uh, American embassy across the street with their plan for engaging the North Koreans, mm. which was a big change. And he handed it to our ambassador who read it and who said, you realize this is not American policy? And the answer was, so? <laughs> <laughs> that, that created a new landscape. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. Okay, I mean, I have, I have lots of questions myself, but please don't be shy here. Uh, there's no such thing as a, as a silly question. Uh, and uh, I'm anxious to encourage. Okay, please, uh, Doina and I think why didn't we uh, uh, yeah. you? Very small question. You want to introduce yourself? Uh, Galina Seidnikova, NPTS student here and uh, Jerry and CNS. Um, yeah, you were talking about sources of information and a lot of your um, highlights were on like the hard data, like pictures or being on site. But in Russia, where I'm from, um, Academy of Sciences uses a lot of information from defectors. So what do you think about that? Do you think, like, you know, uh, to anyone? <laughs> <laughs> I, I have my opinion on, on defectors. Uh, for the most part, uh, from what I've seen related to, to the North Korea situation, it is not terribly useful, quite frankly. Uh, but, but Bob has more experience uh, than I have. We've, we've had a few really good defectors. Right level, right access, right thinking. Um, worked with them over, over many years, and therefore they really were critical in uh, filling out our understanding. Most of the defectors are very low level, right? have had horrendous experiences. I mean, really have to feel sorry for them, but don't really know much more than what was right in front of them. And, but, but they like to enlarge in what they think they know. So you have to be careful not to accept too much. Uh, if you're interested in what's going on in a particular town in a particular province, then that's okay. Beyond that, how would they know what's going on in the missile court? So let me actually uh, just uh, elaborate on that, on, on one of my interchanges uh, with a very high level defector, and, and Bob was also there for one of my meetings with him, uh, and, and I, I can say his name because he's, he's now a, a legislator in South Korea, in South Korea, <laughs> Tae Young Ho, uh, was his name. Uh, I see our colleague over here in the last few years, uh, he, he's an extremely smart, well-spoken guy, and has become, from what I can tell, you know, quite a politician uh, in South Korea now. So, uh, he, and, and he was a high-level, very high-level uh, official in the UK. That's where he eventually went sideways and got out. So I, I had the opportunity, we spent hours with him uh, to talk about the North Korean nuclear program. And so he knew a lot more than what Bob just said, you know, of the ordinary defector. But he didn't know enough, <laughs> you know. So we had very interesting interchanges where, and I happen to know something uh, about Russia because that's where I really spend most of my time working with the Russians, uh, and I've spent a lot of time talking to the Russians about the North Korean nuclear program. And so I'm quite convinced that, that the Russian nuclear complex people have not helped the North Koreans with their nuclear program. And so I've discussed that with my Russian counterparts, and I'm, I'm really very, uh, very confident that that's the case. And, and he tells me, he said, well, you know, in 1992, they have records of when the Soviet Union came apart, that the Russians came and helped the North Korean with their nuclear program. And I said, no, I don't think so. I said, are you sure it wasn't with their missile program? And then he admitted that he really didn't know. And it turns out it was the missile guys that went to, uh, to North Korea because the Russian missile guys, you know, were really hurting. And they were not as isolated as the nuclear weapons complex guys. And, and so they went over there to try to make money. And so there was interchange between the Russian missile specialists and their company. 
uh, and, and in the North Ends, but not, uh, uh, not on the nuclear front. And then he, he also, uh, you know, he, he believed very, very firmly that the North Koreans in the end were never really interested in diplomacy. Uh, they were doing diplomacy to buy time. Okay? And, and I mean, that's the reason. There are lots of people who say that. But Bob and I happen to believe that there were quite a few years when that wasn't the case. And as my book, uh, I, I try to demonstrate, uh, is they've had a dual track. It wasn't just by time. It was they were serious about diplomacy. And they were really serious about bombs. And, and they kept this dual track and would move one above the other uh, over time, depending on the rest uh, of the circumstances. Uh, and so uh, he was still uh, reasonably familiar. He had some details of what happened in the 1990s and the agreed framework. And he said the agreed framework was just to buy time. And, that's and, baloney. And that's baloney. <laughs> right. So I thought, I said, now wait a minute. If they want to buy time, why in the world would they shut the reactor down that made their plutonium? They didn't have high limit uranium. Why in the world would they keep the spent fuel in the pool, you know, and, and not have access to it? Why would they, that wasn't, they weren't buying time, you know, and why would they let something that's hardly ever mentioned, you know, in fact, they have this one reactor with Jeffrey watches, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the five megawatt electric. They had a 50 and they had a 200, and they let those two reactors die during the agreed framework. Instead of making six kilograms a year, they could have made over 200 kilograms of plutonium a year. They let it die. And I said to him, that's not buying time, you know, as far as I'm concerned. But, but at any rate, so, so I, I, I think one has to treat that with um, some caution. Thank you. The only thing I was going to say is I had dinner with Tae Young Ho in oh, London you? when he was still a North Korean diplomat. And I remember sitting there thinking, He's too smart to believe the things he's saying, <laughs> and that's still how I feel about him. <laughs> uh, if I could follow up here on, on a point that I mean, Melina uh, kind of raised here in terms of uh, you know, Soviet slash Russian um, uh, means of acquiring information with respect to, to the DRK. To kind of ask, you know, all of you, uh, we have dealings both with Soviet Union, Russia. Uh, China, um, the degree to which our knowledge of the DPRK has been informed to uh, whatever degree by our interactions with and our uh, friendships and uh, knowledge uh, of uh, our uh, Soviet slash Russian and Chinese interlocutors. Because I know all of you have had that kind of interaction, I have as well. But if you, maybe you could share a little bit, uh, you know, an anecdote or something that would uh, perhaps illustrate that. Uh. So let, let me take the first uh, cut at that and then I turn, my, I turn to my colleagues. Uh, and, and let me advertise that uh, on December 14th uh, of this year, I will give a Zoom lecture in none other uh, than Professor Abner Cohen's course uh, on intelligence. Uh, and uh, and Professor Cohen asked me if, if I would give a talk. I listened in uh, to one of those very fascinating uh, talks. Um, I actually have listened to two of them now. Uh, and he asked me if, if I would talk about it. And, and, and I said, you know, but I don't do intelligence. The, all this stuff, I've, I've never gone as a spy. I've never gone as an intel collector. I, I've gone as a scientist trying to understand or to solve mutual problems, like with the Russians. Uh, and so I thought about it a bit more, and I said, well, you know, what, what can I do? I'm not an Intel guy. And so I proposed the title, something uh, along the lines uh, of what you can learn about nuclear programs by asking instead of spying. <laughs> and, and the answer is one heck of a lot. <laughs> and and we, should, we should try, you know, the CNI, should, we should play this out in future times. I mean, I have, for example, uh, Jeffrey, see this. I just took a picture uh, of it because I was going <laughs> to. I'm going to get you posing with it. Okay, so so this this is my my notebook from uh, 2007 trip to North Korea. I bought it in the hotel lobby. You know, it says Pyongyang, Korea, and and in here, you know, I have 40 pages of all of my notes of everything I saw. But it was it was for me is to understand what's going on. 
I have that from all of my trip to Russia, and you put together the picture of how the Russians really viewed their nuclear weapons program, how they viewed their concerns, how they viewed the advantages, what they thought about a comprehensive test ban. And so you learn immense amounts. And, and the same goes for, for China. You know, I've been to China 39 times. I've had these discussions going through the day with their people also. It's an absolutely essential avenue. So the frustration for me has never been as to what I can discuss with them, what I can learn, what we can discuss. It's the fact that when I bring this stuff back in the United States, and a lot of times it just goes in the black hole. Anyway, I'll turn it over to you. <laughs> No, I mean, I, you know, I would say uh, Matt Bunn always calls it ask int, uh, which I think is, is 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 pretty reasonable. I mean, I think that you know, Bill, you're the one who initially suggested that we use the term new tools instead of open source, um, which I, I think is such a good way to think about it because it's just information. Right, and so whether we are the people who are asking, or whether our colleagues in other countries are asking, or whether they have experiences, like we're just collecting all of that information, and we're using very traditional research methods to make sense of it. And you know, it, a little bit like we talked about defectors, but I think it's also true of, of individuals who travel to North Korea or talk to North Korean officials. Like we're all imperfect. And so we all have slightly different recollections or experiences or interpretations, and like that's normal. And so it just seems to me that what we are we are at our best when we fuse different streams of information together, and it just again have very traditional research methods, asking questions about like how do you know things and how do you think about uncertainty and you know being very humble about about what research methods can do for you with. Such imperfect information. Thanks. Bob, did you also want to Just, you know, the one of the great values of uh, tapping into Chinese and uh, Russians, especially those who were there uh, some years ago, is their experience is filtered um, through the prism of uh, what China and in Russia were like at the time, which is much closer to North Korea. And so they're picking up things that an American will overlook or won't get or will misinterpret. Uh, and so hearing it from their perspective opens up a new vista, which is really important. It's not that they're defending uh, this, they're describing it. And you've got that, if you're going to deal with the North Koreans, you've got to understand it. There is. That's really helpful. Let, let, oh, uh, yeah. let, let me just uh, uh, piggyback on that because it, it reminds me uh, of one of the times I, I had Bob with me uh, to meet with the uh, Chinese nuclear guys. Uh, and we would usually do that. We'd have dinner together at their institute in, in a special room. Uh, and, and Bob was there with me and he was really curious uh, to, to ask. Uh, and this was. Uh, the person who was my counterpart, uh, lab director of their Los Alamos that, that I visited in, in 1994. Uh, and we've, uh, we've seen each other. He, he's uh, also officially retired, but then uh, heads there, uh, one of their strategic institutes. And, and so Bob was curious. There was a lot of talk at, at the time that in places like North Korea, uh, you know, it's Kim Jong un who decides what is going to be done regardless of what the scientists say. And, and you ask him, so what was it like, you know, back in the early days with Mao Zedong? You know, did it essentially, you know, did he override, you know, your technical judgment? You're going to do this come hell or high water? And they said, oh no. Oh no, not at all. Uh, and so their opinions were respected. Uh, and their sense was that's exactly how it is in North Korea. So don't go off and say, these scientists, they're just going to do whatever the hell Kim Jong-un tells them to do. Kim Jong-un knows better you know, as to how to treat uh, his scientists and, and his technical people. So at that point, Bill, please. Hi, my name is Jeff. I'm a research associate of Science Communication Foundation. So we're so to see you again after we met at the company. So, mm -hmm. 
I have many questions for Bob, but I'll keep it for later. But in the meantime, I have a very short question for Dr. Cooper and Zephyr. From Zephyr, it's, it's a really insightful presentation. And so, Did you speak up just so everybody could? Yeah, great to hear the where news press, like what their next has in terms of missile development. It's really insightful. So I was wondering, in the expert control perspective, we always look at not only for the system, the equipment, technology, and software, but also we look at the material. So I was wondering, when you discuss about that missile frame, like, did you find any indication that what kind of material that the most player might have used versus uh, frame? So for Dr. Hecker, so we know uh, there are lots of open source information that indicating that New Square has been working on lithium at six for the hydros and bones so on. Well, I was wondering, have you seen any indicator of New Square working on tritium treatment and productions? I'll just answer that, that quickly. Oh yes, yes, there is information. Definitely they're interested in tritium. Definitely they've developed the capacities for tritium separation and they've made the tritium. Uh, the same with deuterium goes along with that. But for deuterium, uh, that, that's an easy one. You know, that's the number two isotope of, of hydrogen. Uh, that's reasonably prevalent. Uh, the tritium you have to make in a, in a reactor with deuterium, you separate you know, from, from hydrogen. Uh, there are papers, there are facilities where they've done the deuterium separation. We know that they've made this really great compound called lithium 6 deuteride. Uh, we know that they've actually sold some of that stuff. So, yes, they have done a lot of that work. They have the capabilities for tritium separation uh, in the young, young uh, complex. Uh, but their limitation is uh, that they haven't been able to make much tritium because they only have this one reactor, the experiment light water reactor that they showed me along with the centrifuges in 2010, which they told me would be completed uh, by April 15th of 2012, which is, as you know, was the 100th anniversary of Kim Il-sung's birth, and, and I chuckled and laughed, and they said, well, you know, Dr. Egg, everything has to be completed in our country by that time. Because it wasn't complete, it's still not operating. So they, they have a shortage uh, of tritium, and tritium is a half-life. Half of it goes away in 12 years. Uh, and, and so they've got a tritium problem. They do have lithium deuteride, but they don't have the tritium uh, enough of it. So, so my view of the hydrogen bomb is, yes, they, that's quite certain that they detonate a hydrogen bomb, but they don't have enough tritium except for, for a couple of, of hydrogen bombs. So they'd have to really get back in the reactor operation. I was hoping they would not restart the reactor, which they just did in 2021, the 5 megawatt, the little one. Uh, they didn't have it operating from uh, late 2018 on, but they restarted them. They're probably making some tritium now, but it's still very limited. Okay. Jeffrey? I, you know, mostly uh, for tracking uh, material inputs, which, you know, sometimes you see steel ingots show up at these facilities, uh, but mostly that we track with um, uh, like scientific publications, um, and we focused on the defense production factories because we've just really been interested in the machine tooling because we think that that's the, that's the trick that they, that's the problem that they were able to solve. So we haven't spent too much time looking at the upstream facilities for making uh, those things, but there's like a fair number of scientific publications and I, you know, they, they spend a lot of time and effort on material science. So I, I would not be surprised if they were making their own raw materials mostly. I think it's, it's important also to Jeffrey, uh, as emphasized just the title, what we've been able to glean from uh, overhead. But I mean, our open source tools approach is much, much broader than that. It includes all different kinds of publications and the media. And so it's a question of integrating uh, the imagery with what's been written, uh, the personal contacts, uh, and, and conversations from, uh, or comments from <laughs> other parties, whether it's Russian or Chinese, who, who may have experiences with the field as well. Bob, did you want? I want to make a point about uh, knowledge and how you can get more knowledge than you imagine. We've been to many factories, not defense factories, although, no, not really defense factories, but the, the point is the factory managers are all very smart, competent people. These are not hacks. These are not just following the ideology. They know their workers. 
They know how to get the best out of them, and it's not with the whip. Um, and so I have a feeling that in the defense field as well, they are super competent, and we better be really worried about how well they can actually crank stuff up. To piggyback on that, what, one of the uh, indications uh, of that, we walk into a textile factory, Bob, John Lewis, and myself, right. uh, and we go in and the women who are in there, you know, working away and all of that, uh, and, and we listen, it's kind of strange. Uh, it, it was American rock music <laughs> out of one of the speakers, and we asked one of these guys, we said, that's American rock music. We said, yeah, that's what the women wanted. <laughs> Mauricio, you want to introduce yourself? Yes, thank you, Dr. Potter. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Mauricio Zapata. I'm a career diplomat of Mexico, and I am also a CNN assisting fellow. So first and foremost, thank you to the three panelists for their uh, very fascinating and to some extent complimentary presentations. Uh, at the outset, I would also like to say that uh, well, Mexico's position is in favor of disarmament, and, and my personal position as well, but uh, we have also to acknowledge that uh, nuclear weapons exist, and it will take some time before we get rid of the weapons. So my question comes from, from here by, if we look at the fact that from uh, several nuclear armed or weapon states, uh, it seems that the United States it was the only state that certainly tried to uh, keep North Korea from getting the weapons. Uh, Perhaps China and, and, and Russia uh, look to the other side, uh, and in this regard, now that North Korea has the nuclear weapons, uh, and I would like also to refer to that piece that uh, Dr. Lewis uh, wrote in the New York Times, because uh, I asked this question to a former senior State Department official who said that uh, he didn't agree with, with the, that proposal to acknowledge the fact that North, North Korea already has nuclear weapons. So, I would like also to touch upon this uh, very interesting approach by uh, Bob, and apologies, I forgot your last name, sir. Uh, the five circles of knowledge. So uh, it would look uh, like on the other side, how does this play out in the United States government? Uh, I mean, uh, what are the, the views within the State Department and perhaps the Department of Defense about what uh, should the United States do now that uh, it's a fact that North Korea has nuclear weapons and they will not give, it, give them up easily. So, uh, what are the debates, perhaps, that, that you are aware of within the, the, the United States government? Thank you, Dr. President. You want to tackle the one related to your... Uh, I mean, I... Op-ed is a matter of public record. I, you know, I don't know if I can improve on the argumentation. I, I think I would, you know, so for everybody else, I just... My sense is that it's extremely unlikely that uh, we will ever be able to make a credible offer of a better relationship to Kim Jong-un that will be sufficient for him to want to give up the nuclear weapons he's acquired. It doesn't mean that we didn't have those opportunities in the past, um, but that's very hard for me to imagine that at this time. And so it seems to me that given that we share an interest in avoiding a nuclear war with the North Koreans, and I think we have a profound moral interest in trying to make the lives of people who live in North Korea better, um, even if we we can't make things perfect, um, that it's, you know, I, I think it's foolish to hold all of our policies hostage to the idea that Kim Jong-un has to disarm. So I don't think that's likely to happen. I'm very eager to find other ways to move the relationship forward, whether that's reducing tension, finding ways to better crisis communicate, or also trying to think about possibilities for uh, aid, assistance, and economic development, um, all of which I think contribute to the general goal, which is if you want to avoid a nuclear war with North Korea, which I do, the first step is probably avoiding any kind of war at all. But Jeffrey, why the U.S. sticking to this position so for so long? Why? Because it works if you it's a it's very successful if you open your mind to what the problem is that has to be solved so the problem that has to be solved isn't uh, reduce the risk of an, a war with North Korea the problem that has to be solved is tends for policymakers to be much shorter term it's avoid any political costs keep the hill off your back 
don't have awkward and annoying meetings with your allies in South Korea and Japan. And if you if you optimize for all of those short-term management things, um, then the dysfunctional policy actually is quite functional. Mm -hmm. I, I, the governments in Tokyo, and at least when you have conservative governments in South Korea, they like this policy, even though it's failing. Uh, this policy is not controversial on the Hill, even though it's failing. And so why would you give up a policy that's working in that narrow short term just to fix the problem? Because all you're going to do get if you do that is a, is a load of trouble, which is exactly what the Obama administration discovered when they fixed the Iran problem. You know, like nobody sent Barack Obama a valentine for the Iran nuclear deal. Uh, you know, it was pretty roundly attacked in Congress, including senior Democrats like Ben Cardin and Chuck Schumer voting against it. So I, I, I think it's a, okay, it's a dumb policy, but it is highly adapted to the political environment in which it exists. So it's entirely bureaucratic. Yeah, but just a yes. second. I'm going to try to moderate the discussion here. Sorry, I'm done. <laughs> that, that's all I have. <laughs> okay, so I did, the, the original question I think was directed not only to, to Jeffrey, and I think Bob actually was one of the, the targets of the primary question. target. Would you care to weigh in? Well, you've got to understand I've been out of government for a while. Uh, but I was in there long enough, and I keep talking to enough people that I have a feeling there have not been um, great changes in how people think of the problem. And the problem is most of the government is in this first circle, uh, Pluto. Uh, they have preconceived notions, and they're very hard to shake. Uh, they believe that the North Koreans are uh, deceptive, that you can't negotiate with them, uh, that even if you get an agreement with them, they'll break it. Uh, they are much uh, more liable to believe classified intelligence that comes across their desk than the unclassified stuff, which in many cases is much more reliable. Uh, the higher the classification, the more people believe it, even though that's that's not, that's not how you should uh, evaluate information. So uh, even today, when people understand the policy isn't working, they can't imagine that there are ways to make it work. And today, the big problem is they don't understand there's been a strategic shift. For 30 years, the North Koreans wanted to engage the Americans in order to achieve normal relations. That's gone. That's completely gone. And therefore, when we sit down to talk to them and we reach into our playbook thinking, ah, now we're going to get them, they won't be receptive. Mm -hmm. And I don't know anyone who has begun to think about how to live in this new world, me included. It's really hard to understand Kim Jong Il's thinking at this moment when we most people assume it was what it was in uh, Singapore and he really wanted to make concessions. So I think that's a big problem we face and uh, people have got to grapple with it. Thank you. Please, do you want to identify something? Yeah, Bob, um, my name is Leon, BTS, and sounds good. Just add to the what you said, under government officials, scholars working for the government and security advisors, what they will struggle in under the Moon uh, Jae-in is that whenever they come to the U United States, talking with either scholars or and the Hill officer, always it's, it's like they, they feel like a, they're facing like a wall. Even even they're the person who really recently met these North Korean people. Now only a minute, it's more than an hour so that they you know have a relationship. They do look they. they they're not really delivering. They're the experts about the North Korea. They studied like 20 or 30 years about it academically in the, in the field. They don't, they don't just trust it. They have no intention to change it at all. They're really by it. They just have a, you know, as you said that, they really struggle to, you know, in, they're the liberal, they want the peace, very different from the conservative. They won't, they won't really want the changes, but it doesn't work. It doesn't really work. Yeah, I just want to, yeah, yeah, I know. Thank you. Um, let me ask, and then I'll come back to you in a second. So, I think 
there is a convergence of views about the problems that we confront today, the difficulties, whether it's missed opportunities, uh, whether it has to do with uh, you know the, the circle in which we find ourselves on the U.S. side. But I suspect we can also ask, or you know, maybe we use the same uh, you know uh, circular logic on, on the Korean side and the Russians and the Chinese. How do we move forward? How do we how do we advance uh, the process so that these two parallel universes, I think, Bob, that you described, begin to converge at least a little bit, uh, given all of the constraints that we face today, whether it has to do with the pandemic, visas, domestic politics? Is there? I mean, are we just? Tilting at windmills, or is there something that we can do? Is there some way forward? I mean, Sig likes to talk about science diplomacy, which he, uh, I think, was a master of. But it's it's hard to conduct that diplomacy when uh, you know the governments are are not anxious to see it uh, I think, uh, succeed. So let me ask each of you if you have some suggestions about what we might do at least at the margins to improve the situation. Jeffrey, do you want to? Who is the is the we here? Is the we here are those of us on the outside? Uh, I haven't thought to distinguish. <laughs> well, so I, I mean, the reason I ask that is, you know, we're producing a third season of the podcast that started as the deal uh, on the Iran nuclear deal, and it broadly looks at the question of uh, what can what role can outside groups play, uh, and you know, it's very interesting because I think uh, what what those of us on the outside can do. And, Although with sanctions, it can be quite difficult. Um, but, you know, a lot of times uh, governments find it very unnatural to cooperate. And the value of outside groups is you, we can demonstrate that cooperation is feasible and that there are things that we can do. And so, the, you know, one of the famous examples I think about is in the Reagan administration, when officials kept walking around saying there's no way that you could possibly ever imagine verifying any uh, uh, of these agreements, particularly for sea-launched cruise missiles, and, and NRDC somehow convinced the Soviets to let them on on a Soviet ship with gamma detectors and take those measurements. And it, that doesn't directly end up in the subsequent arms control negotiations, but it, it really profoundly undermines the claim that there's nothing that can be done. And so, I, you know, I often think about the work that Peter Hayes at the Nautilus Institute did uh, on renewable energy in North Korea, which, again, helped demonstrate that these are people, they have legitimate interests, they have an energy problem, this is not just about nuclear weapons, and it, it's about trying to get people to think about, about the problems in a kind of broader, bigger way. So, I mean, as, as, as loath as I am to say it, right, I love focusing on nuclear weapons, but in some sense, I'm the problem, right? Because... As long as we make this relationship about nuclear weapons and disarmament, I don't, I don't think it goes anywhere. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm happy to try to think about like what we might do technically, but fixing this relationship, I think, requires fixing it comprehensively and in places that don't have anything to do with the bomb. So I, I, I would certainly say I agree with uh, that. I'm the problem. <laughs> with, uh, the last. Uh, Comment. It's more than just nuclear weapons. You talk about Peter Hayes, uh, who has terrific ideas as to what to do uh, to help the North Koreans with, with energy. But the unfortunate part right now is they're not answering the phone. They're not interested in, in any of that. And, and we've tried many of those things. You know, our good colleague John Lewis, that was his approach, is sort of looking at it all in, in terms of North Korea. And here in this uh, pamphlet that, that I mentioned to you, so I have my Wait, notes. that around in this steel. <laughs> so I, have, I have my notes from the visit, and Bob will remember this, 2017, to hospital number three, TB hospital number three. It was the only time I was really scared in North Korea. <laughs> I know how to deal with nuclear stuff. I know how to monitor for that. But for tuberculosis, and they had this man with multiple drug-resistant tuberculosis in North Korea. John invited their doctors here to Stanford, to the Bay Area Consortium. All of those, those were the right kind of ideas to look at the whole spectrum of things. 
But the nuclear is this big aberration. You somehow you got to reduce that barrier. And, and we missed the opportunity. So in the book, I explained for 30 years why we didn't get there. But as Bob has said, and I'm going to let him elaborate on this, the game changed. The game changed on February 4th in the Xi Putin summit. And you could see how Kim Jong-un was changing his view of what he's going to do strategically. And so if he's no longer interested with the United States uh, reaching a, a strategic accommodation, mm -hmm. so what I would focus how can we change that? How do we monitor? Bob has always told me that they're very light on their feet. They can change their mind. I mean, if you look back at history, 2017 was sort of as bad as it gets. You, you know, when, when, uh, when Trump said fire and fury, you know, the rocket man and all that. We thought, my God, it's, it's hell. And then at the end of 2017, things changed. Both the North Koreans changed, and actually Trump, in this little way, uh, you know, sort of opened up, but then he could never think so about it. But where are we today? <laughs> well, this is actually one of the few disagreements Sig and I have, 2017. My view is and was at the time in July 2017 when Kim witnessed their first ICBM launch. He gave us their first signal that he was prepared to give it to diplomacy. And through the rest of 2017, every single one of their uh, important statements was a building on that. Now, they went ahead with uh, a bigger ICBM and then with the um, hybrid H-bomb test, which really threw people off. They weren't focused on what was important, which was Kim felt, until he convinced the Americans that they were serious and dangerous, the Americans would not deal seriously with him. Now, we may not believe that, but that's what they thought. And that's why he was doing what he was doing. I think conceptually there are two things that we can focus on. Uh, remember I said Kim is, is concerned with more than just the nuclear issue. He's got a lot of other things on his plate. One of them is the economy. Uh, from the time he took over, at least until through 2020, Kim was engaged in an economic reform program. Very serious. Very, very serious reform program. Uh, it got, and that's why yeah, Singapore was so important to him because if you could just get the American piece in place, his reform program would get an external uh, security environment that would be propitious for him to move ahead. Didn't work. Okay. I think he. I don't think he's throwing economic reform overboard. I think he's still interested in it, and somehow we want to be uh, alert to that. The second thing is China. He may be sort of aligned with China now. But historically, uh, and even relatively recently, uh, Sino-North Korean relations are bad. They're good now, they will get bad again. And we need to be ready to um, step in, it seems to me, and show him that there's an alternative. Okay, Aaron, I'm going to give you uh, <laughs> the last word. It's such a good place to end it. Depending upon very, what you have to say. I'm just very curious from this review. What do you think history would think about the whole Trump exercise? With <laughs> it's, it's probably a topic uh, to be considered in the know, future. Unless, I mean, I... MAGA historians will have a very different take than real ones, right? Yours. yours, yours, yours. <laughs> uh, it's a great tragedy. This is a man who yeah. was touched by the gods to take a step that no other American president could take. Had this meeting with Kim Jong-un, which opened the doors, and then did not know what he had accomplished, couldn't sustain it, and it all crashed and burned. That's how I it. And actually, you know, I, I cover that in the book uh, in, in, some, in some detail. My view is very, very similar. He actually, for whatever reasons, he had the right idea. You know, Kim Jong Un sort of opened that door. He walked through it. He did things specifically. You know, sending a message in December two thousand seventeen to Kim Jong Un that he was ready to meet. 
So he took the Kim Jong Un, he was ready to meet, he met with him. Singapore was a fantastic success. So he opened it up and then he blew it. it you know, for whatever reasons of doing things that were focused on himself, instead of taking that God given opportunity to actually go and finish that off, he did it wrong. And I try to cover in the book, it, it was John Bolton that got him prepared to take that step. And actually, John Bolton brags about it in his book. You know, he says things that none of us knew. And, and so he got him to think that walking away at, at, uh, at Hanoi was to his personal advantage. And, and actually, at that time, both the right and the left of the political spectrum in this country said, right. And I said, and I think Jeffrey also said, I said, wrong. <laughs> wrong. You know, that was the first big hinge point was walking away from the agreed framework. The last big hinge point was annoying. And we've paid the price since. So that Thank you. Um, as you recall, about two hours ago, I said <laughs> this is a seminar about which I was very, very excited. Uh, and I must confess that uh, my expectations were not only met, but uh, uh, surpassed. And so I ask all of you to join me in uh, expressing our appreciation to what I thought was a fantastic panel, and one that we will return to in the future, I can assure you. So please join me in... <laughs>